Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Josh Kulibau of Do These Cards Suck and How, Jack Slack, it's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you on Monday the 18th of March, following a pretty mid-weekend of fights. If you're here, congrats, you're busting your ass as a UFC fan. I hope they invite you to the theme park when they make it. Now, you know, more Apex Slop, uh, really felt like Apex Slop this week. If you want something more interesting, I do talk about these on the boycast, but there was the Rise El Dorado card on this weekend, which in the tiers of Japanese kickboxing is about as good as it gets, aside from like a good K1 Grand Prix. And even then, you know, there's some K1 Grand Prix that are not actually K1 Grand Prix. But Rise and K1 are the two big promotions. They had a few of their champ versus champ fights on this card. They co-promote with each other really well, actually. Um, it's a... Lovely thing to see. But the one I was raving about on the boycast, and I put out a preview um, with the video even, I even edited in some video to show what I was talking about on the boycast, was Yuki Yoza versus Ken Nakamura. Yuki Yoza, my most beloved kickboxer, because he does ki all kinds of cool things, like kicking out of a rhythm step, which is where you bounce your lead foot back level to your rear foot, um, and then kick. And throwing Valerie kicks, which is that roundhouse axe kick, with, uh, roundhouse kick with your heel. And throwing the Yoza kick, which is any front kick thrown to the back leg of the opponent. And he was fighting Kan Nakamura, who is my least favourite kickboxer because he doesn't do anything for most of the fight and then just sparks people all of a sudden. And I was really surprised because Yuki Yoza against the Southpaw Kan Nakamura couldn't get going. He's a big combination fighter and he couldn't get anything started and uh, he seemed so aware and or he seemed so um cautious of ken nakamura's big left hand that ken nakamura was able to build up a lead just kicking just throwing these kicks with his rear leg against one of the best kickers in the sport yoza was landing this left hook constantly as a counter but he seemed terrified to open up in combination he wasn't really comfortable kicking he changed the southpaw occasionally and get calf kicked the calf kick doesn't exist in kickboxing, I hear you cry. Yes, it does. Um, but the important point is that he started to make a fight of it in round three. He started to make it look like a cushion fight. Got up in Ken Nakamura's grill, was posting his head on Ken Nakamura's, throwing body shots into, into low kicks and things. And Ken Nakamura threw low kick and started circling out the side. Yuki Yosa did a jumping back kick, the kind that he landed one in round one, the kind that you see all the time in Kyokushin from very close in. You jump and you throw the kick, not even looking most of the time because you're too close to see the opponent. And instead of hitting him in the gut and folding him in half, he hit him in the dick. And because it was such an important fight, the referee decided that that was a knockdown and never corrected his decision afterwards. He started the count and he was like, oh, it's over. And then no one was able to convince him that the kick had actually been to the groin, even though they have access to replays and there's big screens in the arena. It reminded me of Agbeko versus, what was his name? I forget. The one Russell Mora let the guy hit him in the dick 300 times, and then Agbeko got hit in the dick in the last round and took a knee, and Russell Mora, having deliberately ignored all the, all the groin shots throughout the fight, probably due to corruption, but he argued due to incompetence, had to count it as a knockdown and started a count. It was incredible. But anyway, that happened, and then the main event was Toki Tamaru versus Shiro, which was another ultra-hyped fight. I was very excited for it. They started quite slow, and then at the end of the first round, Tamari slides down the outside of the lead leg as the southpaw, throws a, to throw a left hand, doesn't get the left hand off, but collides heads with Shiro. And they immediately apologises. Neither of them seems hurt by it. But a big cut opened, and that was the end of the fight. I'm probably not selling this rise card very well because there was some really fun stuff on it. There was a fight with five knockdowns in a round and a half, which is mental. There was a fight between Chad Collins and Miguel Trindade, or Trindade? I don't know, it was Japanese commentary, but Chad Collins, it's been, he had a really good year last year, he's a very good fighter, and he loves a step up inside low kick with his lead leg, and like, you know, if you started watching him and you didn't even know that, you'd know because of the way he stands, he stands with his back foot pointing almost out sideways because he wants to step it up into that little T-step and throw the inside low kick, and Miguel Trindade had the absolute read on him, because he waited for that inside low kick, took it on his inner thigh, and threw the right hand at the same time. And even if it didn't chin Collins, it hit him in the guard and sent him off balance. And then Trindade would immediately step up and throw the left kick. The kick, 
the leg that he'd just been kicked in, he'd pick it up and kick. And he hit Collins in the head and knocked him down the first time. And then he knocked him out with it the second time. Very impressive stuff. Uh, and a terrific read. Man came in absolutely prepared for this guy's point scorer and bit on it immediately and blew Collins out of the water in a way that you didn't even get to see like how the rest of their skills matched up. So people won't be interested in a rematch. They're just like, damn, levels to this. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, stuff we normally talk about on the boycast. But because you are probably starved of good fights this week, I'm telling you to go and watch Rise, El Dorado, 2024. Mm. Having a bite of my hot cross bun. These Apex cards are driving me to the food. But then if I get too out of shape, they might ask me to headline one. Your main event was Tai Tuivasa versus Marcin Tabura. Marcin Tabura, main event. I dread these because he's been he's been given like six main events, I think. Maybe not six, but it too many. I remember having to write an article about Marcin Tabura in 2016, no, maybe 2015, when he was headlining against Fabrizio Verdum, and he hasn't really grown much since. The only thing he's got now is a terrible haircut. His main thing as a heavyweight is having cardio, at least some. Doesn't have any power, though, which is always a problem at heavyweight. But here, he was competent enough to make Taito Ivasa look very bad. Taito Ivasa... Uh, traded with him early, threw the right elbow that he loves throwing about three or four times, managed to cut Tabura open just below his terrible haircut, but then got pushed to the fence and then it was a locked hands double. And yeah, uh, Tabura had his hands locked underneath Tuivasa's butt along the fence and Tuivasa had one arm in as an underhook and it wasn't really doing much. And instead of trying to like move his hips or improve his position somehow by wrestling, he got the other hand and he started awkwardly slapping across the head, you know, because there's very few legal strikes you can do from there, in a way that didn't really do anything. And then he got taken down. Quickly gave up his back, got hit with a couple of dozen hard punches while face down with Tabura on his back, and then got choked. Tabura is insane to watch because on the feet, it's literally like he just puts his hands out at people from the worst positions. His hands are completely disconnected from his feet, which is part of why he has no power but he's constantly just poking people and trying to run forwards and backwards. And he's awful to watch, and I never want to watch him again, but he got a finish, so he's going to be pushed. And, you know, he was in a main event this time, he'll be in a main event next time. What else we got? Well, the co-main event was as annoying as the main event. You know, this this, this was the theme of the weekend, weird fucking fights. Um, Brian Battle versus Angelosa, or Angelusa, ends by no contest, accidental eye poke, round two. Uh, round one, Brian Battle seemed to be taking control. I've always liked Ryan Battle, mainly because he's a tall guy who uses front kicks to the body off both stances. Oh, hello, Sean O'Malley. Um, front kick to the body in MMA, so money. A lot of people don't like doing it because it feels like your leg's out there for the, uh, for the opponent. But the great thing about the front kick is that people tend to pick it up and then be way behind your knee. If your knee's in front of them, you've got a good chance of fighting off the takedown. If you throw a round kick and the guy steps up the middle inside your knee, you know, good chance of getting bundled over. If you remember when you're wrestling, a single leg, you pick up the leg, normally it's between your own legs, and you want to try and get it to one side or the other so you can get closer to the guy and trip out his back leg or convert to a double. It's kind of like the calf kick. If you watched uh, McGregor versus Poirier 2, McGregor's trying to like lean into the calf kicks and catch them. And if you do that with a kick to the thigh, you put your you put your weight on your lead leg and you bend your knee into the kick and you angle your knee outwards slightly so that the kick rides up your thigh and you catch it with your hand and you run straight through him. With the calf kick, he was a little bit further away and he'd have to reach all the way down to his calf to try and pull the kick up. And whenever he did, he'd take the kick, pick it up, and it would be he'd be right on the end of Dustin Poirier's leg and Dustin Poirier would push kick him away or pull his leg back and get free. So front kicks to the body really useful in MMA. They take it out of you in a way that most people still don't expect. You know, I remember when McGregor fought Mendez, people were absolutely bewildered by the fact that the guy who stood on the fence under pressure, getting kicked in the body a dozen times in the first round, tired very quickly. Battle's hands, I think he benefits a lot from his height and length because his head is always just straight there to be hit back. But because he keeps guys on the end of his reach, he hits them and they swing back and he's you know a couple of inches out of the way. 
He's a switch hitter, and there was a really nice switch in the middle of an exchange. He was southpaw, Angelusa was uh, orthodox. He threw his one, two, or whatever it was, got clipped with a counterpunch, stepped to his right, past Angelusa's lead leg, taking away a lot of Angelusa's options, and as he did so, he drifted into a, a orthodox stance, but from uh, from the side, basically. So he, he stepped out to the side, and he was 90 degrees to Angelusa, and he threw a left hook and hit him. It was lovely. He was also using the Taitu Avasa slash Mark Hunt uh, clinch counter, which is put your hand underneath their chin and push up as hard as you can. Uh, works really well. You know, this is this is ancient shit. This is in the Bubishi, uh, the ancient Chinese text that was shared among karate masters in Okinawa. Uh, put your hand underneath their chin and push up when they try and clinch you. Still works. Angelusa got double underhooks and then got uh, thrown with two overhooks to the floor. Ended up mounted by uh, Brian Battle and actually did a pretty good escape. The same one that um, Jamal Hill used against Glover Teixeira when he was stuck under, when he ended up underneath the mount. Glover Teixeira, obviously very good top player, probably the best mount in MMA. Jamal Hill popped his hips, dug his arms underneath the legs, and then bridged and ran out the back. There's the danger of getting caught in like a triangle or something like that if you're grappling jujitsu wise and you put your hand down between their legs when they're mounted on you. But in MMA, You'd almost prefer them to try and do something like that than sit on top and hit you. I mean, that's a, a great... That's how most of the MMA escape meta was built. It's better to get up. You know, it doesn't matter if you're offering opportunities for the guy to try a submission and fall to his back. It's always better than being stuck with no movement and no momentum getting hit. Second round, they come out. Angelusa shoots a bad takedown. Brian Battle sprawls quite well and then pushes off the face with the thumb in the eye and then all hell broke loose. Angelusa says he can't continue. Well, he don't, He said to the doctor, he said to the ref, I can't see, which is never the thing you want to do. Unless you want out of the fight, which is the, the accusation that people have made against Angelusa. When you say you can't see, the doctor basically has to stop the fight. Even if you say it within the five minutes that you can recover, you, go, you don't get to go, I can't see right now, but give me a minute. If you can't see, just don't say it and take the minute. It's like making a joke about a bomb in an airport. You don't do it. So Brian Battle gets really angry, uh, is pretty classless in the post-fight, and then they threaten to come to blows. And of course, that looks silly because Angelusa has just said he can't fight, and now he's like, I will fight you right now, bruh. Now that I definitely won't get the win money for it. <laughs> oh. But Brian Battle seemed absolutely perplexed with the fact that you can lose on a foul when you're winning. He was like, but I was winning. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but if you stick your thumb in the guy's eye and it ends the fight, you know, it's going to be a no contest probably. Unless you've done it like a load of times and then they might give you a DQ, but they probably won't because it's MMA. But I thought he looked really good. I think that's the thing. Um, you can get a no contest and look really good. You can, you, I mean, you can lose and look really good, but uh, I think they probably just move him forward. So I mean, what's the point in doing the rematch with Angelusa? Unless they're so hard up for apex fodder that this is actually a pretty compelling storyline and they're like that'll get people to tune in let's find something good um oh mike davis he's back uh his, his annual fight mike davis is so strange and he did a post-fight interview that came up on my twitter feed and there just seems to be like layers of law with this guy to explain why he never fights and he's really good at it every time he fights you're like damn Mike Davis, can't wait to see you put together two or three in a row. And he has put together four in a row, but it's going back to 2019. Lost to Gilbert Burns in the second round back in 2019. Beat Thomas Gifford in one of the all-time worst beatings. Terrible work from that man's corner. Terrible work from the ref to not stop it. Fought Mason Jones, who was coming in ultra-hyped off being a Cage Warriors champion, was undefeated. Beat him. Fought Borshev, who obviously is, is brilliant hands, terrible grappling. Beat him. Comes back, fights Natan Levy, easily beats him. He came out in the first round, Natan Levy's southpaw, Davies is orthodox. He pressures him to the fence, checks his lead hand, and immediately throws a right straight down the centre, knocks him down. First punch of the fight. Takes Levy's back, and then there's a bit of the old Randy Couture, Tim, uh, Tim Sylvia. That reference, me I mean, that's really old now. I'm, I'm really old. <laughs> or put a penny in the complaining about being too old jar. I said two weeks ago on the Voicast, I was like, I'm complaining far too much about being old. Um, Randy Couture, when he came back to fight Tim Sylvia at heavyweight, he was way smaller than Tim Sylvia, hit him with an overhand right off the bat, knocked him down, got on Tim Sylvia's back. Tim Sylvia turned so that he was looking up at the ring lights, 
with Randy Couture on his back underneath him. And then that's just a pure hand fight. Because there's nothing Randy Couture can do from there to hit him, effectively. Occasionally you'll see a, a heel to the solar plexus, a la John Tuck or BJ Penn, but very rarely. There's not really anything you can do when you're stuck on someone's back underneath them to hurt them. So Tim Seeley just held onto the hand so that he wouldn't get choked and then waited the rest of the four minutes and then waited the rest of the round. And by the time it was round two, I mean, he got beat up in every other round, but he wasn't close to being knocked out again. So there was a little bit of that here. Levy eventually ended up coming up on top and Davies hit a cool X guard into leg entanglement, which was very cool. Round two, Davies gets him down again, and uh, there was some open guard play against a standing opponent, and it was like traditional Gracie self-defense stuff, with one knee across the guy, hips arched up from the floor, uh, from Levy this is, and uh, then he dug underneath the leg and spun underneath him and started coming up on his back in a leg drag. Very cool move from Mike Davies to hop across the top, because the leg drag is uh, a powerful position if the guy can come up and get on top of you, but if you can stay up above him and jump over him, then you're in, good, you're in a good spot. Levy turtled, and what I really liked was that he turtled in, in what's called an open turtle or referee's position, which is where your elbows aren't on the floor, you're up on your hands. Very good for getting up. Davies immediately grabs the wrist that's nearest him and puts his weight down through it to keep that hand on the floor, which means that the gap between knee and elbow on that side is open, so Davies throws in his leg as a hook, climbs on the back, starts threatening the choke, and then eventually comes up on top to the arm triangle. There was an interesting bit in the first round when I was talking about him getting trapped on the bottom while on the back. Because Netan Levy was holding his uh, his arms, or his hands rather, he couldn't get his elbow out to start coming up on top, which is really important. You, you miss that a lot. You'll see really good guys come out from the back, get on top with the arm triangle, because you can slide around the guy as you come up and into mount, or at least half guard. But being able to get your elbow to the floor is a really important part of that, generally. Unless you use like a butterfly hook to try and sweep him and then come up with momentum. But if your elbow is stuck over the guy's shoulder or underneath the guy's arm, and you're trying to, to get up on it, obviously you can't do it. So he gets his arm free and he does it this time around and he finishes in with an arm triangle. Very nice. I've been thinking about doing a spin-off from the Filthy Casuals Guide called like Grappling in MMA. If you think of a good name, tell me. But... Uh, I've already got a couple of to topics, the half guard get up, the rear naked choke and hand fighting, and um, the mutual ashy, which I'm always going on about. But just a filthy catcher's guide, but to a position that's commonly seen in MMA. So maybe I'll talk about it then. But uh, the, the one that I was going to talk about was the current rear naked choke meta, which is very interesting. We talked about it with Umar Namagomedov, but you're seeing it all the time. And I don't know if it's, if it's catching on from him or just because I only really noticed it when he was doing it and now it's really common. But... Uh, getting people down along the fence, and as they build up on their hand, you ignore that hand because it's weighted, and you use two hands to trap the opponent's other hand and then punch in the choke on that side. And that's how Gerald Mearshart got Brian Barbarena, and how Jafel Filio got Ode Osborne. Same stuff, both fights. But in the Ode Osborne fight, Osborne makes the choice to flatten himself out. Because the secret of it is if they're up on their hand, that hand can't protect their neck, so you are effectively two hands on one, which is what you're always trying to get. In, uh, in grappling when you're on the back. Normally you have to try and like trap one of their hands underneath one of your legs so that you've got two hands against one of their hands. But when they're up on their hand and they don't want to be flat on the mat, they're already limiting themselves. But Ode Osborne recognised that he was about to get choked, so he, put, he dropped down on his elbow and he fell to his side. Uh, and he did end up getting choked flat on the mat. But uh, yeah, he put it off for a little while. It's like the Dagestani handcuff. It's a choice where you go, am I going to get flattened or give up my back? This one, you either give up the choke or you go flat and you get beat up a bit. A dilemma, that's the one. A lot of people thought Christian Rodriguez versus Isaac Dolgarian was the fight of the night. Uh, Dolgarian's wrestling looked great, but he did zero damage throughout the fight. And Christian Rodriguez, until he got, until Dolgarian got tired in the third round, he looked a little bit desperate there. Um, he kept giving up the underhook in top position. So he'd get taken down and then he'd just open his arm and let, Dolgarian grab an underhook and slide knee slide pass through or get the uh, keep him in half guard. And if you give them the underhook from the top, they're just going to keep flattening him out. You can't build up without the underhook. Like I said, I'm going to do underhook get ups in that series. This fight was notable for a non ironic attempt at a Peruvian necktie, a, a submission that you use in the gym to show off <laughs> or to punish people who are just sort of like sitting in the turtle doing nothing. Um, 
I can't remember the last one I saw that succeeded in MMA. It's so low percentage. And when you do it, you almost always give up position because you jump into your back. It's like, why are you jumping to your back from front headlock when there are so many attacks that don't involve jumping to your back? Or at least you can then, like, if you jump on a guillotine and you sit through into that where you got the shin across the chest, where you got the shin across the belly, uh, or a half guard, you can at least turn the guy over with butterfly sweeps. Peruvian necktie, you just end up in a mess. But in round three, Dolgarian tires out and he starts shooting the worst takedowns ever. Actually, that was the thing. Both the, the key takedowns at the start of round one and the start of round two. Dolgarian comes out, throws a low kick naked, hits Rodriguez with it, and Rodriguez comes back with punches because he's like, how dare you? And immediately, Dolgarian drops under the punches and gets the takedown. You know, it, It's real easy to make people swing back at you. And if you can do that and you're a good wrestler, you've got a free shot. Think of Kamzat, how he starts like three or four fights in his career. He started by throwing a high kick and the opponent goes, oh, why I order? And then loads up an overhead and gets taken down immediately. Or Jailton Almeida with the front kick to the face. People told me that Ovin Sampru versus Kennedy and Zuchuku was a banger, but it wasn't. It was two rounds of Kennedy and Zuchuku's redneck coach going, go now, go, hit him, do it now. Yet another reason that the Apex sucks. Because these fellas should have had 10,000 people booing them for two rounds. Um, just terrible. Kennedy ends the with Every fight of his is a chance to reassess him and where you put him. Because for a couple, he was the funniest fighter in the UFC. Really terrible. And then he suddenly started putting together good performances. And you're going, damn, this guy's getting better. And he's actually looking all right. And then he just comes out against a 40... Is he 41 or just 40? 40 year old Ovinson Pru back off retirement. Ovinson Pru has never done enough in his fights. He likes throwing only the left side of his body, one at a time. And the one time he threw a combination in his UFC career was when he threw like a double jab left hand at uh, John Jones and surprised him and actually gave him a bit of trouble. And then he went back to never throwing a combination. But man was in Shukwu reluctant to test that. Uh, he was just completely tepid for two rounds. Third round, they finally start putting it together and hitting each other, but man, too little too late for me. I will say two things from Ovinson Pru I liked. Lean out the side door, clinch uppercut, um, what we used to call the Jack Johnson uppercut, because there's clips of Jack Johnson doing it, and there's even a, a photo of him demonstrating it in a newspaper. Uh, head outside their lead shoulder, and then throw the uppercut across your body. So let's say you're uh, orthodox, you put them on the left side of your body, and then you throw your right uppercut under your left armpit, basically. And Ovin Sapru stunned him with that. And then the other thing was that in the early going, Kennedy and Chukwu is doing what Yan and Song Yudong were doing constantly in their fight the other week. Splayed fingers straight out in front of you. Both those guys love an eye poke and a headbutt. But uh, Kennedy and Chukwu was doing that. And Ovin Sapru had the very wise idea of hammer fisting the fingers, which I really like. Um, you know, we've seen Khalil Roundtree when he's in the hand fight. Uh, Southpaw versus Orthodox, because he's a Southpaw, so he fights some Orthodox fighters. They reach out for his lead hand, and his best weapon is his, his right hook, which is his lead hand. Um, and he doesn't want people covering that. So he pulls his hand back and he hammer fists their arm, which, if it's a 205 pound man who hits like Khalil Roundtree, probably hurts after a few of those. But to do it on the fingers is inspired. And you could say, damn, that's attacking someone's fingers, that's illegal. To which I say, close your hand. No one's making you keep it open. I've always thought the referee should pull these light heavyweight bums in when they're splaying their fingers and standing with straight arms in front of each other's faces. Pull them in, kiss his palm, put it in their hand, close their fingers over the top of it, and then whisper in their ear, don't drop her. Problem solved. If Chris Toyoni did that to me, I don't know if I could focus on fighting because I'd be coming so hard. Anyway, trash fight. Trash fighters, trash division. Trash card. Uh, anything else left on this card? Macy Chiasson versus Pani Kianzad. I thought this was an interesting one because Pani Kianzad is on like it was was on an eight fight decision streak or whatever. But she had a nice little arm bar set up in this one. Um, something that Habib used to do in his like 30 seconds on the bottom in his UFC career. And uh, Alex Morono does too. When you end up in closed guard on the bottom, you pull their head down, you, pull, you break their posture, bring them in, and then you start sliding your knee in front of one of their biceps to threaten a triangle and some overhook play, 
which is a way to attack, but it almost never works because the opponent will go, no, and stop bringing their elbow back to the inside of your knee. But when they do that, they're bringing their elbow to the center line, which means you can hop your legs up for a top lock over their shoulder and then into an armbar. And she did that, and it was really cool. Uh, she just missed on the elbow sl slightly, uh, and then M Macy Chasson got on her back. It was interesting. This fight was like a mix of cool grappling techniques and then just general crap grappling awareness. But Macy Chasson got the rear naked choke and the win. We've done Mirshat versus Barbarina, but man, Gerald Mirshat. Imagine if he was born with even an ounce of fast twitch muscle fiber. He'd be unstoppable. Because even now, he stands there in front of people, jabbing with the speed of a barge, and then level changing when they come back in on the world's worst double legs. And he's still dangerous. Tiago Moises and Mitch Ramirez had a fight where it was 2018 again. They were like, I've just discovered calf kicks but I haven't discovered checking calf kicks. So they were just calf kicking each other until Mitch Ramirez fell down. And then the one that I really wanted to see, Josh Kulabau versus Danny Silva, couldn't watch it because I watched this the morning after and the UFC put up the prelims with bugged video and audio. And then they broke, put up the individual fights. And if you go to the Josh Kulabau one, still now, 48 hours later or whatever, go to the Josh Kulabau one, it's a still image. <laughs> 21 minutes of a still image. Because no one in the UFC cares about these cards. No one at Fight Pass cares about these cards. The only people who care about these cards are the dudes devoted to defending them online. Let's head to the mailbag for a quick question then. Hey Jack, any tips for an amateur fighter who's been having a ton of close fights, split decision losses, etc.? I've noticed a bit too much backing up and letting the opponent dictate the first round, then picking up the pace later on when it's too late. I find I'm using too much floaty footwork and not doing enough to dictate the pace. Any fights I can look to for examples of good pressure and overall pace setting, or techniques you find to be useful? Cheers from New York. Dave. Um, the obvious answer is, of course, don't leave it in the hands of the judges. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. It's like, yeah, we just all accept that judges are inept. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just, just finish him, bruh. No, obviously, finishing people in, of uh, equal skill to you or even slightly lower, you know, people who know how to survive, it's very difficult. Anyone who actually knows how to fight, it's quite difficult to finish. It's a, it's a skill that people acquire. But in terms of pacing, I think you've just got to, you know, look to uh, some of the resources on amateur boxing about this. There was a book I used to recommend called like The Ultimate Boxer by, I think it was the captain of the women's US Olympic boxing team or something like that. But she had interesting thoughts on judges and how to play them. And that's a book that even breaks down the two different uh, judging configurations that they had at the time. It, one was like five judges and one was three judges and where they sit and how to take action to the part of the ring where the least judges can see it when you're wanting to take a break and then move back to where most of the judges can see it when you want to score some points and get to work. So you can get really in the nitty gritty with that, but I think you just got to think of it like you're doing a theatre production. When you go to the theatre, having watched a movie or something the night before, the first 10 minutes you're like, why is everyone shouting? This is all incredibly over the top and cringe. But when you're in a live venue, you need to show people what's going on all the time. You don't have the close up of the ca you don't have the camera close up and the zoom and stuff. So think of it like that. When you want people to see what's going on, make it obvious what's going on. If you're saying now's the time to work, throw a combination, break off, throw another combination, up the pace, make everyone see that you're doing that, and then float off and have a lower pace and let the other guy not really work effectively. Which is of course an acquired skill, but I think one combination break next combination is something that you can really work on because certainly even in the highest levels of this game, oh, who, who was that awful fight? It was Armand Petrosian versus AJ Dobson in the UFC. This was uh, 20, October 2022. They're two guys who were billed as kickboxers and are supposed to have very, lots of experience. And then they just had this fight where they went, it's my turn to throw. Now it's your turn to throw. Now it's my turn to throw. It's like neither was neither was landing very effectively. And also it was just like, what are you going to score? You work out who throws the last combination of the round and you go, yeah, fuck it, they can have it. So being able to throw a little flurry and either wait to counter or if they don't throw back immediately, throw a second flurry. It's a very important skill. And if you do that two or three times around, suddenly you're building up like these moments of activity that stick with people in a slower, low-paced fight. Now, obviously, if, if the opponent starts doing useful things and takes you down or whatever. Well, I don't know. You didn't say whether this was MMA or kickboxing or what, but if the opponent starts having success um, with actual hurting offense, 
or positional domination, you've got problems. But making the difference in a fight that's pretty evenly fought without giving up too many opportunities to the opponent, uh, it's putting on little flurries and putting together pairs of flurries. And also, if you get in the habit of doing that, flurrying and then taking a beat to see if they throw back and then throwing another flurry, you also learn how to offensively counterpunch. Because if you flurry and then you wait a beat to see if they come back, and if they do, you're hitting them. And if they don't, you're still hitting them. Like That gets you in the mindset of not just, it's my turn on offense now, but then it's his turn. That gets you in the mindset of, it's my turn on offense, and then if he throws back, I'm going to really hurt him. Lots has been written and said about stealing rounds. You know, you can go watch Sugar Ray Leonard working for the last 30 seconds of rounds against um, Marvin Hagler. You can watch Muhammad Ali when his legs were shot in his later career. He'd take a round to hold and like not let the opponent do much. And then he'd take a round where he really did good work and everyone, went, well, clearly Ali's round. Because if the close rounds could go either way and then there's a round that's yours and it just alternates like that, you've got a great chance of winning on the cards. Whereas the opponent has got to be sort of lucky to get the judges to give him the rounds that he's not really working in and not give you the rounds where you are working. Then the other part of setting the pace of a fight is being able to tie up and smother people. Really useful. If they get going, you smother them when you want to have a rest. In MMA, of course, that uh, opens up the threat of the wrestling. But there have been very high activity fighters and there have been low activity fighters and both have been able to win rounds. I would suggest looking at the work of uh, the Machida brothers, Lyoto and the lesser known, but still cool, Chinzo Machida. They did very, very little, and they just made their big moments count. Now, you can get into the trap of being a Cheeto Vera type guy then, but Cheeto Vera's thing is that he lets the opponent throw punches on his guard and stuff. The Machidas were never about that. It was a very exaggerated distance, and it was always like the threat of the counterpunch was so obvious that the opponent's activity rate really dropped. So if you want the opponent to do less, establish the threat of big counters. And if you want to win rounds when the opponent's doing less, Throw some flurries and uh, try to offensively counterpunch or put a couple of flurries together. Again, slow first round is not necessarily like uh, a nail in the coffin for your amateur career or whatever, but it sounds like you know that's a problem. Like You don't have to come out a million miles an hour to still value the first round as a time when you're supposed to be fighting. It's not Lumpini Stadium and there aren't gamblers being like, hang on, keep it on the back burner for the first round. We're still getting the bets in. But, you know, this is trickery, what we're talking about here. Um, you know, the, controlling the pace of the fight is a skill, nay, maybe an art, but we're talking about like little simple tricks to steal rounds. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to you either have to really lean into um, keeping the opponent from doing anything and then countering them when they do, or you have to up your activity a bit. There's only really two ways out of it. Cheers, Dave. Right, I reckon that'll do us for today. Have I said already that this was a dreadful card? Next week's a bit more fun. We got um, Bellator Champion Series, a, a, a phrase I hadn't even heard until I was assembling my fight calendar that I do professionally as my job. So God knows how anyone else was going to know that that was happening. But they got Corey Anderson against uh, some big Irish lad. They got Patricio Pitbull versus Jeremy Kennedy, who's pretty good. Had a good fight with Volk back in the day. Volk uh, dominated him uh, along the cage. This was cage wrestling era Volk, but he did some good half guard get ups. So might come up in my uh, upcoming video. Uh, you've got Fabian Edwards is back. James Gallagher versus Deandre Higo. Hey, Tafik Messiah is back against Alfie Davis. That'll be fun. And uh, Kieran Clark is fighting another guy with less than six fights. <laughs> what are they doing with this dude? At least he's got a winning record this time. But it's Bellator in, uh, well, Northern Ireland, but still Ireland. Uh, you know what they're doing. It's like, SBGI, get all your fighters in here, even the really bad ones. Though no Sinead Kavanagh. But then the UFC fight's got uh, Amanda Rebus versus Rose Namajunas at the top, and largely looks like trash. Except buried in the middle, on the prelims. My boy, Ricardo Ramos, versus my other boy, Juicy J. Julian Arosa. That's a banger, ladies and gents. And then you got Rise in Landmark 9 in Kobe as well, which uh, has Satoshi Souza on, Igor Tanabe, he's a pretty cool grappler. So it's not terrible. If you want to get in on the second podcast of the week, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Chelsea Chandler managing to sprint away from the opponent in a second UFC fight. Bless.